Welcome to Corporate Warrior, the podcast that brings you the best advice on how to improve your health, optimize performance, and maximize productivity with your host, Lawrence Neal. This episode is brought to you by ARX, the most innovative, efficient, and effective all-in-one exercise machines I have ever seen. I was really impressed with my ARX workout. The intensity and adaptive resistance was unlike anything I've ever experienced. I love how the machine enables you to increase the negative load to fatigue target muscles more quickly. And I love how the workouts are effortlessly quantified. The software tracks maximum force output, rate of work, total amount of work done and more in front of you on screen, allowing you to compete with your previous performance to give you and your clients real-time motivation. The ARX uses a computer-controlled motor to give you the exact amount of resistance your clients need 100% of the time. This means that the resistance can never become dangerous, is intuitive and simple to use, and can provide you with all of the results you and your clients are looking for in a fraction of the time. ARX is highly effective and efficient in delivering all of the benefits of exercise, including increased strength, muscle mass, cardiovascular conditioning, bone mineral density, and injury recovery. As well as being utilized by many high-intensity trainers to deliver highly effective and efficient workouts to their clients, ARX comes highly recommended by world-class trainers and brands, including Bulletproof, Tony Robbins, and Ben Greenfield Fitness. To find out more about ARX and get $500 off install when you place an order, please go to arxfit.com and mention Corporate Warrior and How Did You Hear About Us field. So again, to get $500 off install when you order, head on over to arxfit.com and enter Corporate Warrior and How Did You Hear About Us field. Hey there, I am Lawrence Neal and welcome to another episode of Corporate Warrior, the podcast that shows you how to optimize your health, get the most out of your high intensity training and start and grow your hit business. My former guests include the who's who in hit, people like Dr. Doug McGuff, Drew Bay and Jim Flanagan, successful hit entrepreneurs and researchers and trainers like Luke Carlson, Adam Zickerman, Dr. James Fisher and many, many more. This episode is also brought to you by the Hit Business Membership. It's a private online forum I've created with exclusive content on sales, marketing, hiring, retention, operations, and much more, all within a Hit Business context. I also provide monthly Q&As of experts, high-grade community, full of thought leaders and hit entrepreneurs and coaching from me to help you get maximum results. This is a resource and service I've created to help you grow your hit business and achieve your goals. If you're interested in joining, please go to corporatewarrior.co forward slash membership. Today's guest is one of your favorites and certainly one of mine, Dr. James Steele. James is the Principal Investigator at UK Active Research Institute, an Associate Professor of Sports and Exercise Science at Southampton Solent University in the UK. He has published many peer-reviewed articles on a variety of areas relating to health and fitness, with a particular focus upon the impact of resistance training. In his role at UK Active, Dr. Still is working to translate academic expertise into real-world practice and utilize the insights of what is happening on the ground with UK Active members to further the knowledge of what works in getting the UK moving. You can contact James via Twitter. His handle is at James Steele the second, so James Still and then two capital I's. Uh, or you can go to the show notes on this one over at corporatewarrior.co forward slash effort, where you also find links to James's work and his contact details. James is one of my favorite people in exercise. He's taught me a ton over the years and really given me a greater appreciation and understanding of exercise science and its practical relatability and limitations. Uh, Dr. Still is a huge resistance training advocate and can be seen doing plenty of grueling and impressive hit workouts over on Instagram. Uh, and I'll put his Instagram in the show notes and on YouTube as well. And he's probably best known for his bodyweight hit workout, courtesy of Hit Uni uh, YouTube channel, which uh, you can check out. And I, I've drawn a ton of inspiration from uh, James's stoic training style over the years. And in this podcast, we talk about James's recent re- recent research focus on effort in exercise. He came to realize that a lot of the research on effort is often conflated with other variables like discomfort and has been working to provide clearer and new definitions to measure effort more effect- 
accurately, God, I can't speak today, in future research. We also talk about James's new role at UK Active and his influence on UK physical activity guidelines, which is very, very exciting since um, James is a big advocate of resistance training. And obviously a lot of the science supports that resistance training is probably the most effective way to improve overall health in an exercise context. And I know many of you will also be excited to hear that he is in some way part of the team to really influence uh, the physical activity guidelines in the UK, which is very, very cool. Uh, and we finish up this one with some good old chit chat around his current training uh, and discussion around training programming and much, much more. Uh, again, apologies. This has been published very late in the day. We actually spoke back in June and July. And one thing I've learned is it's really not a good idea to publish podcasts out of sequence because I think it kind of makes me look like I'm changing my mind or my viewpoints aren't very well aligned because the order is kind of strange. So for example, I published a couple of episodes on bulking up, uh, which you might remember one I did, which was a, a solo cast. And then Doug McGuff's reply to that. And I actually published those very quickly. I, I, I recorded them and then published them the following week because I had to do them in the right order um, to, for it to make sense with Doug's re response. But that kind of put things out of order a little bit. So um, it might be weird because you'll hear me say something maybe on a podcast like this one where I've actually perhaps said something different uh, in a podcast before or perhaps I've referenced this podcast. So it might not be a big deal. It might just be in my head and I don't think perhaps you guys care all that much. Um, but if you do see some inconsistencies, <laughs> that is why. So but rest assured, I will not be putting things out of sequence going forward. Uh, all the episodes that I'll, I'll, I'll publish in the future um, will be in chronological order. Uh, but obviously, I've still got a bunch of episodes which I did back in June, July, which will be coming over the next few weeks. And you know, alas, they will be coming out after those ones I did with uh, my, myself and with Doug on bulking up. So do bear that in mind uh, when the future episodes are published. And James, apologies, you've had to wait so long for this one. Anyway, I'll stop rambling on. And without any further ado, I give you Dr. James Steele. James, welcome to the show. Hi, Lawrence. Thanks for having me. Always a always a pleasure. Been a, been a while since we've uh, we spoke. So excited to catch up with you and um, find out what you've been up to. And you've been a very busy boy lately. Um, so <laughs> this will be this will be a lot of fun. So let's start off um, talking about, I guess, what you're kind of focused on at the moment. Perhaps give those that don't know you just a little context on your expertise, and then just dive into what you're currently looking at. What's your focus right now? Okay, yeah, sure. So um, if any of the listeners had uh, listened to our previous podcast, I know that I'm, I'm based at uh, Solent University in Southampton. Um, so I'm an associate professor of sport and exercise science there. Um, but recently, I've also taken on a second post working for an organization called UK Active. Um, and so now I'm principal investigator heading up their research institute. So I've kind of got the two roles at the moment. Um, the the Associate professorship role at Solent is um, is now a research only post, um, and it kind of works very nicely with the uh, UK Active post because a lot of the work that we've done historically has been leading me closer and closer towards the kind of public health sphere in terms of physical activity and exercise, and I know we've kind of spoke about that in the past. Um, and the work that UK Active doing are, are doing are kind is kind of more on that kind of public health side of the sphere. Um, but one of their um, their kind of uh, philosophies at UK Active is this idea of taking research that's conducted in the lab in you know supervised kind of um, quote unquote idealized settings um, and seeing how well that translates out into the real world. So the idea that kind of you know stuff we spoke about in the past where we might do a study and compare um, different types of training interventions that's often done in a in a lab or a, or a controlled setting in a gym where um, the participants are under close observation everything's controlled it's supervised we know exactly what they've done and we can speak to the uh, the efficacy of those interventions but that's very different from uh, that's a different question than whether or not making recommendations to, to do that actually works in the real world. Um, so it's kind of that translational route from does it work if we do it in a perfect setting to can we get it to work 
in the real world, so to speak. Um, so it's quite exciting stuff. And uh, I'm still working on, um, you know, a lot of the res- resistance training work that I've been working on previously uh, at the university, um, amongst other projects. Um, but at UK Active, I'm working um, across a real spectrum of projects at the moment, not just focused on resistance training work, but um, looking at, you know, broader kind of projects did you just hear my cat meow in the background <laughs> I, I can i can it's fine oh, he's here. <laughs> <laughs> just needs a good stroke james that's all he does oh, he does <laughs> um yeah so uh so at, at um uk active at the moment we to give you a kind of sample of some of the projects we're doing um we're working on um the largest database of um exercise referral schemes um in the uk at the moment in fact it's the only uh, database that we've got data on uh, almost 25,000 people that have gone through exercise referral schemes, uh, kind of pre and post data. So we're looking at analyzing that at the moment. Um, We've got a number of projects in kind of residential care home settings uh, where we're looking at exercise based interventions um, through to kind of kids work as well, where we're looking at uh, physical activity and exercise interventions in schools in a range of different kind of formats and settings as well. So a real kind of like lifespan approach to, uh, to what's going on. Um, so yeah, so uh, as you say, busy at the moment, and uh, a, a real range of projects to keep me kind of interested and stimulated. What is the type of impact you're going to be able to have in this new move? Um, so one, of, I mean, one of the things that really drew me to wanting to work with UK Active, and actually, it comes off the back of uh, they've had a recent kind of internal restructure as well, actually. Um, so the research institute at UK Active now is much more closely tied with their public affairs team and their communications team. So for me, I can see it as, you know, I can take uh, an idea from its kind of like seed, uh, test that idea in the lab, you know, whether a particular approach to to exercise or whether a particular approach to trying to get people to exercise or, you know, optimize a particular outcome because it might be important for health or longevity or, or, or anything like that. Test its efficacy, you know, in a controlled lab based setting at the university um, if it works, I can then take that idea and look at trying to um, implement it and understand uh, whether it works in the kind of real world setting. Um, you know, considering that kind of public health focus, look to see whether it works in large samples of people where the data is really noisy and people don't do exactly what you tell them to do. Um, and then once we've kind of got a grasp of, of that kind of evidence base, being able to then actually influence policymakers, um, influence, you know, a wider, uh, communicate those ideas to a kind of wider, um, you know, listenership, viewership, readership, whatever you want to call it. Um, so th- there's much more scope to get those ideas out there through um, UK Active um, because of the, you know, it, it's essentially one of the kind of like, you know, uh, biggest stakeholders in the kind of physical activity, sport, exercise and health kind of sphere in the UK. Um, and, and even on an international basis as well. So we've got a lot of international collaborations. Um, there is uh, currently Spain active and Europe active, which are kind of similar institutions. Um, and we're looking to try and create a big sort of like network worldwide, essentially, with um, an institution in each kind of country, kind of all working towards the same kind of approach, essentially. Awesome. That's, that sounds good. Um, so... Is this? I guess I'm guessing, and I'm seeing more. I mean, I know you were on. Uh, I think you said you were on Channel Four recently. Um, are you going to be in the public eye more? Are you going to be doing more media as a, as a part of this? <laughs> yeah, that, that that's the idea. Uh, part of the uh, the new role is to be the kind of face of, of research as well. I'm not sure I've uh, I've really got the face for TV, but uh, but yeah. So you're right. I was on got the abs. <laughs> I can already tell which photo you're going to use for this uh, podcast, Lawrence, if you've been scrolling for Instagram. <laughs> oh, or the, the one at Discover Strength, is it that one? Oh, it could be that one. Oh, you might not have seen it then. Great, okay. great, oh, bi- oh, great bicep on the waterless um, <laughs> pullover, I think. But no, is there another one that I'm yet to see, is there? Uh, maybe. I'll let you go find that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I forgot what I was going to say now. And, oh, yeah. So, the, so, yeah, there will be a lot more media appearances. Um, the stuff on Channel 4 was really interesting because, of course, um, as you know, you know, resistance training is is my primary interest in terms of modalities of exercise. Um, I, I've become a little bit more kind of um, uh, laid back with respect to, um, you know, so, some of the hit community are very kind of um, 
what's the word? I'm gonna. I, I, no one will like it, but I can, but my brain's not working on a Friday afternoon. You know, uh, they're, they're very um, cultish in terms of uh, terms of you know, you do it this way or no way. Uh, but whereas I'm. They can be. You, you know, you know I, I'm, I've become a lot more lenient in terms of actually, I'm a little bit more agnostic. If I'd rather people are doing something than nothing now. And I know there's many people who will disagree agree with that. But, but frankly, the, uh, the evidence is, uh, is suggested that something's better than nothing. Um, but I'd also like to move people towards doing something that's better than just, you know, a little bit. Um, so resistance training is a big focus of mine still. And I'm still trying to figure out ways to take the research that we've done looking at you know, efficacious approaches and figuring out how to make that an effective um, kind of recommendation that people can actually follow from a public health perspective. Um, so we were kind of talking about, um, you know, uh, scalable home-based uh, body weight resistance training approaches and giving some examples of some exercises that people can do um, and kind of talking about the importance of, of, uh, of a kind of high effort training to failure yet low volume approach to this type of thing in a way that actually you know anyone can do in the comfort of their ho- own home really to try and break down some of those barriers so it was a good opportunity to kind of um, you know get some exposure for those ideas um and actually actually i don't know if you're aware of this this either but um currently the uk uh chief medical officers are going through the process of revising the physical activity guidelines in the UK. Um, And I'm actually involved in that process. So I'm on the expert working group uh, that is revising the adult physical activity guidelines. Um, And (laughs) as you can expect, I've been tasked with reviewing the evidence around resistance training. And, uh, And so hopefully... Based on, the reports, based on the reports that we've put back to the, the CMOs, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a number of stages to the process, and it won't be really until sort of uh, probably mid-2019 that the new guidelines will come out. But there's likely to be some changes, and there's pretty much unanimous consensus that there will be a bigger focus on the importance of, uh, of resistance training in those guidelines. So it's really positive move, I think. Wow, no, that's great. And this is so cool to see. It's so cool to see someone like you having a much greater impact and being able to influence this stuff. So what are the guidelines currently and what do you think they're going to look like? So at the moment, um, you know, everyone's familiar with the, uh, um, you know, quote unquote aerobic portion of the guidelines, which is the you know, uh, 150 minutes of uh, moderate activity or uh, 75 minutes of vigorous physical activity. And, um, you know, that's based on kind of, of METs, metabolic equivalents. Um, uh, you know, most people are aware, aware of those guidelines. Um, the guidelines do currently include recommendations to engage in what are termed muscle strengthening activities. Um but based on the last uh, review that went into producing the current guidelines in 2011, um, it was explicitly stated that the, the kind of you know, muscle strengthening activity guidelines, which is to, to engage in that, uh, those activities, it's very non-specific in terms of what's recommended um, two times a week. Uh, the, the review did state that they should be placed as of secondary importance to the uh, you know, quote unquote aerobic portion of the guidelines. Um, so at the moment, we've got the problem that the guidelines um, de-emphasize the importance of, of that portion of them. Um, so not many people are even aware that they form part of the guidelines. Uh, but also, when you actually then look at those guidelines, the, um, uh, the, the specifics around how to achieve them are simply just not there. In essence, it says to take part in what they term muscle strengthening activities twice a week. Um, And if you look at most places where they provide recommendations of what that could be, so the NHS, for example, they'll include things like resistance training, uh, whether that's with free weights, machines, body weight, or, you know, elastic bands or whatever. Uh, But then they also include recommendations that things like Tai Chi or yoga or gardening or domestic chores will meet those, those guidelines. Um, And from my perspective, the, of course, you know, the, uh, those activities are, are worlds apart. Uh, some of them are quite well evidenced to improve things like strength, if we're going to call them muscle strengthening activities, like you know actual resistance training, um, whereas there's far less evidence 
no evidence for many of the other activities. Um, you know, then I'm, I'm open to them, them being absolutely wonderful for, for various outcomes, even, you know, things like improving strength. But um, currently there's no evidence for that. And so if we're going to make public health recommendations based on evidence, you know, that we can't really be recommending those things. Um, so in terms of what I think or I hope the new guidelines will look like, there will be more kind of specificity in terms of uh, what we mean by um, well, I, I, I'm hoping that we, we move away from the term muscle strengthening activities and actually be more specific and say people need to do resistance training. Um, but that there's a little bit more guidance about how to achieve that because one of the big barriers for most people, you know, uh, your listeners won't be included in this, but many of their friends and family, if they're not engaged in this type of activity, the big barrier is, well, they just don't know how to achieve it. And it's perceived as being quite a complicated, difficult thing to do. Um, we know the evidence is actually that it can be achieved in you know very very simple um, uh, uncomplicated ways and so hopefully we'll we'll have a set of guidelines that provide a bit more specificity in terms of what to do um, but also in such a way that it makes people aware that actually it's quite easy to achieve these achieve these uh, these outcomes so do you think in the new guidelines when they're eventually released that um, resistance training will take center stage and other stuff will come become secondary are you that ambitious or optimistic? Uh, no it's there's a, there's an there's an element of kind of um of politics shall we say to it as, as well because the, the process revolves around obviously um a number of expert working groups made up of um you know academics in a variety of areas reviewing the evidence and and coming to a kind of consensus within the expert working group as to what they think the guidelines should be. Uh, there's a series of, of stages to the review where those reports that we produce will be reviewed by other academics and other experts. And, and there's all, there's, it's not just about when it comes to providing public health guidelines. Uh, uh, this is something that I'm learning as well, which is really interesting is it's, you can have um, kind of the opposite effect if you go too far in terms of swinging the pe pendulum because people <laughs> are not very good at, at dealing with drastic change. <laughs> and so uh, it's a slow process in terms of subtle moves towards what the kind of ideal would be. Um, and, and the worry, as always, with public health guidelines is that most people aren't um, able to interpret the evidence around them. And so when guidelines, recommendations and guidelines swing from one extreme to another, um, people get confused, people lose confidence in what's being said. And so no one does anything. Um, and so that's Very always the point. No. Mm. And it's, you know, it's something I hadn't really thought about, uh, really. And um, so it was quite interesting to kind of be involved in that process and hear that from some of the more experienced public health experts who are involved in the process um, and being able to have those conversations with them to say, well, you know, I've reviewed the evidence and and I would make these recommendations um, of what to do. And then balancing that with, well, you know, can we kind of meet in the middle somewhere where place more emphasis on them, but not swing so far in terms of you must do this, but let's move people closer towards what the ideal is. Um, you know, I suppose it comes back to the old ad adage of the perfect being the destroyer of the good. We want people, we don't want people to, to stop doing things because, you know, they, they lose confidence or they perceive it as being, you know, too drastic a change or whatever. We want to kind of slowly nudge people towards doing the things that we already know work. Um, but, you know, they're going to take a little longer longer to uh, to come to appreciate i think how do people learn about the guidelines though because i'm thinking in my head like well people probably get it from mass media um and personal trainers i suppose but i'm just curious because i'm like well would they really be that confused and and uh, you know is the messaging that um contrasting and, and, and prevalent that they'll get confused. I'm not so sure because they get so much mes mixed messaging already from health and fitness media. So is, yeah. so what I'm trying to say is like, re is, is a drastic change in, in, in like, you know, UK fitness policy really going to have a negative impact? So uh, I think there's probably something to unpackage there because it's something that I've always struggled with, with um, until recent years is that, you know, you, you look at these things from the perspective of what you've seen and you almost have your own little kind of echo chamber. And it reminds me of um, of a, an experience I had. I was giving a talk to um, kind of the um, a board at, at Nuffield Health, which is a private health provider here in the UK. 
Um, and I, I presented some statistics around participation and resistance training and noted that on the whole, uh, most uh, surveys that you look at that have actually used appropriate surveillance methods show that less than 1% of the population in terms of females are actually engaging in this. And someone said, oh, you know, well, that that's clearly seems wrong to me because every time I look on social media or on Facebook, on Twitter, or on Instagram, you know, the, uh, strong is the new sexy is the new kind of meme and there's all this and all that. And I had to point out, but who do you follow on social media? What kind of media do you consume? You know, you're, you're in the industry. You're missing out on the fact that you know, you think this industry is massive and includes a big portion of the population as a whole, but actually it's not. It's pretty tiny. There's not that many people in it in the grand scheme of things. And we often fail to look outside of it to consider what is going on in the public health sphere. And actually, the, the this is interesting as well, because you're quite right, right? The messaging around it can be confusing in terms of what the, uh, the media suggests. And there are issues with how the gu- current guidelines, for example, are communicated and, and whether they are communicated. Um, the idea is is um, is often that medical prof- prof- professionals, GPs, nurses, you know, um, surgeons, etc. If, for example, um, it's identified that someone should be, you know, is inactive and should be performing more activity. The suggestion is that they should be providing um, these people with recommendations based around the current physical activity guidelines. And there's some, you know, simple kind of one page of handouts and things like that. And and that's where the kind of every man, every woman will will be getting these recommendations. It's more likely that, uh, you know, if you're already active, you probably don't need to know what they are uh, because but it's for the people who are currently inactive, who are likely to be visiting their GP and, you know, social worker or something like like that. Um, but I, I, you, you do make a good point that there's, there's, there's poor messaging around that. And in fact, that's another um, strategy that Public Health England is focusing on at the moment, which is um, a, a program called the Moving Healthcare Professionals, which is trying to educate doctors, medical professionals on um, this idea of kind of make every contact count and actually have those conversations about why exercise is important, what the health benefits of it are and this kind of thing and make it a normal part of the process rather than, um, you know, a kind of afterthought for the doctors who are active themselves. It's a bit like at schools, you know, where you probably remember being at like junior school, school, primary school, school. What was the teacher that taught PE? The sporty one. You know, there's no PE teacher. Yeah. It's just whoever happens to be into, into sport is the one who has to teach PE. It's the same with, you know, medical professionals. If you're a doctor and you happen to be a bit of a, a fitness enthusiast, then you're likely to recommend all your patients do it. If you're not, then... You don't because you don't receive any training. You don't receive any emphasis on why it's important. Um, you know, and that's just the first step. Um, that's not even taking into account the well, what do they actually recommend? And then you know, the, the easy barrier is will they provide the physical activity recommendations? Maybe the next step, you know, over time is to get them to think a bit more about, or either we make the guidelines more specific and a bit more evidence based, in my opinion, or we actually have some form of training where a doctor can say, well, actually, you know, you could. You, you know, you could do these things. Let me show you how to do them very simply at home or even a signposting process of, you know, OK, you need to do this. Here is a list of trainers who are qualified, who can provide you with the service, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of work to do, which I'm realizing. And it's it's we get kind of stuck in the fitness industry of thinking it's a really simple solution because we've already bought into the idea that it works and it does work. But it's about kind of there's a next process of that it's it's this kind of efficacy it works when you do it versus does it work when you tell people to do it and and what are the layers involved in actually getting people to do it and all of this kind of stuff and it's it's a very complex system uh which is uh, which is uh, fascinating to work in, in now it's a new puzzle that i'm getting quite interested in how to crack Oh, good for you. I mean, so does it, is it fair to say that as time goes on, your career will become more political than scientific? You'll move away from the research? <laughs> I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, look, you know, that's the way, uh, you know, the world is run to a degree. And if you want to affect change, then you kind of have to understand how to uh, be effective within that context. Um, unfortunately. Um, so do you think that's where your career will go? Um, I no is is a simple answer, or at least I hope it doesn't. Um, I I I know that that I need to have an appreciation of that now, and I need to be able to understand it, and I need to be able to think about how to um 
do what I need to do within the context of the system that is influenced by, you know, politics and things like that. But it's the same anywhere where, you know, it's been the same at the very early stages of my career when I was trying to figure out within a system that was not set up to enable me to do the kind of research that I wanted to do. It was, well, how does the system work? Let me just figure out how to get shit done in it. And uh, and it's the same same sort of process now. So it's more an awareness rather. You know, I... I um, it's certainly at UK Active, and, and the same applies at the university as well. This is why my positions changed there, because essentially, uh, although I've got the kind of two positions on paper, it's one role that works across two un- uh, organisations in reality. Um, that, you know, the, the research institute sits within UK Active to generate an evidence base, essentially, and find out uh, what works, you know, who it works for, um, you know, what works best. Uh, what doesn't work and things like that so that we can provide the evidence for then you know that my my, my manager my boss at the at UK Active is the uh, director of public affairs so as much as you know I'll have a, I have a, a role to play in terms of um, providing that confidence to the policymakers that the evidence base is there for the decisions that they're potentially making um, I'm not necessarily the one who has to you know <laughs> take the brunt of all, all of that work uh, as much as I get involved in it now. Oh, good stuff. So um, I want to, um, I guess, pivot slightly and talk about some of the work you've been doing in terms of the role of effort in exercise. Um, do you want to talk about, I guess, uh, you know, we were talking about how best to to discuss this on this podcast. Um, and you gave a presentation there when you were in the States um, to, uh, to ACSM and then a more abbreviated version to Discover Strength. Um, so do you want to talk about the work you've been doing around effort, the problems defining it and then kind of what your findings have been in that in that sphere of late yeah sure so the, this all you know obviously just a quick kind of background is you know fr- from the resistance training work that we were doing you know uh the idea of training to failure was something that was interesting to us coming from that kind of you know quote unquote hit background um and I obviously had some problems with the kind of ways we were defining and using terminology a few years back and kind of rallied against this, you know, consistent misuse of the term intensity um, and, and tried to sort of differentiate for, for the resistance training community within sport and exercise science, um, you know, that we should be talking about load and effort as separate. And it got me thinking a bit more about, you know, well, OK, what is effort? How do we define it? How do we measure it? How do we manipulate it? How do we try and figure out what role it's playing in terms of uh, the adaptive response to, to resistance training or just exercise in general? And um, it was it was really at that point that I started sort of starting to look into the literature to see, well, you know, what does that currently say about effort? And, and I was always, um, always trained, you know, during my undergraduate degree and, and even before then that um, have you come across the the RPE scale or, or the Borg scale, Lawrence? I have, yes. So, so this this is the kind of classic um, scale that is used to to measure uh, perception of air, of effort, and 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 it's important to realise that it's a it's you're essentially using the scale to measure or ask someone to rate their perception of effort. So it's kind of there's a kind of a three stage process to it. There's the effort, what effort is itself. There's the perception that the person has of it, and then there's the fact that they have to provide you with a rating of it. And uh, you know, as Dr. House says, everyone lies. So, uh, <laughs> so there's all these problems of kind of measuring it. But we first noticed it when we were looking at. Um, I was looking back at some studies, and of course, kind of by definition in my head, if you train to failure, you're essentially essentially training to the point where you know, despite trying as hard as you can, you can't continue meeting the demands of the exercise that, that you're putting on yourself. So, if that's lifting you know 50 kilos um you fail when you get to the point that um assuming that you are trying giving an, an honest effort as, as hard as you can that's another problem with it of course you know we have to assume that people are actually volitionally trying as hard as they can but you know in theory by definition when you fail that's because you can't produce enough force to meet the demands of the task anymore simple as that and uh and so I thought, well, if, if people are trained to failure and you give them a, an RPE scale to, to rate their effort, they should, in theory, give you a maximal rating every time you give it to them if they go to failure. But I kept on looking at study after study after study of resistance training where they had people trained to failure and no one was giving, no one was reporting maximal RPEs. 
And, uh, and it just seemed weird. I thought, well, well why is it that, that this scale that's supposed to be measuring a perception of effort and you know, under normal conditions, we'd assume that our perception of effort should match up pretty well with what the actual effort required is. Um, you know, why are they not given these max efforts? And um, that was when I started to notice a kind of pattern in some of the, the research whereby um, you know, certain conditions were, were giving higher efforts than other conditions. And so one of the kind of classic examples was a study by Shimano and colleagues, and they have participants train uh, using a variety of different loads. Um, so they have people train with, um, uh, I think it was 60%, 80%, and 90% of their one rep max. They train to failure, and they use something called uh, the uh, a CR10 scale. So it was a kind of zero to 10 scale. So 10 would be a max effort. Um, and they did back squat, bench press, arm curl, so barbell curl, and uh, each one was performed to failure and didn't matter what load they used, no one reported a maximal rating of effort at that point of failure. But the 60% 1RM back squats had a significantly higher RPE than any of the other exercises at any of the other loads. And that got me thinking, well, back squats, low load back squats to failure are really, really fucking uncomfortable. <laughs> They're not very pleasant at all. Uh, it's like doing a low load leg press or a wall sit to fa failure. It's pretty uncomfortable. So that's what got me thinking about whether or not the tools are right that we're using and whether or not the instructions that we're giving to people with these tools are actually getting people to rate their effort or whether people are mistakenly rating things like discomfort and, and, and right. things like that during the exercise. Can I just buy in a second and just ask you, is this this issue with the definition around effort, is this, and without, you know, I'm not going to uh, suggest specific studies or specific meta-analysis, um, but, but I'm guessing that this has muddied the waters quite a bit in previous, um, uh, you know, systematic reviews of literature, because it's another variable that's difficult to measure. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and not even in the sense that, so, so like I said at the start, there's kind of two, there's a, there's kind of layers to it in that you can control for the, um, the actual effort based on what the demands of the task are. Um, but then if you want to kind of, you know, the, the actual rating of the perception of effort that people are giving you, that's the more difficult, uh, thing to kind of pin, pin down. So a lot of a lot of uh, previous reviews, yeah, you're right. They haven't necessarily controlled effort by having a kind of fixed, um, I suppose, endpoint to the t task. For example, having people trained to failure. Um, if you have people trained to failure, even if the ratings that they give you are not um, accurate because the tools aren't very good at getting people to accurately rate their perception of effort, um, you know that you know by definition, if they train to failure. Um, again, assuming they've given a, 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 they've actually tried as hard as they can, that is maximal effort. So you can control effort even if, for example, the scales aren't giving an accurate perception of it. Um, but you know, if 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 any reviews or meta analyses or anything like that aren't taking that into account as one of their inclusion criteria for studies, then it can cause some problems. Um, to give an example, though, uh, just to link back to the kind of previous discussion around the public health stuff as well, because. It's not just the um, the potential role of effort or the perception of effort in terms of um, uh, the adaptive response. So, for example, what role does effort play in terms of how much stronger you get after resistance training, how much hypertrophy you gain and things like that. Um, but there's a body of research um, looking at the role of effort in terms of um, enjoyment for exercise, um, what are called effective responses, so the kind of emotional response that people have to exercise, because um, there's kind of theoretical models that, um, you know, again, thinking more, oh, the cat's back, <laughs> thinking more in terms of the, uh, the general population, um, one of the reasons the vast majority of people don't exercise um, is, for, is because people don't like it, and it makes you feel bad, um, and, you know, fitness uh you know Gillian michaels type fitness people aside who rave on about endorphins and etc etc and the feel good factor of this and the runners high and blah 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 the simple matter of the fact is that most people don't like exercise um and so there's there's a body of research looking at what's called dual mode theory whereby at a certain kind of threshold um of of perceived effort and it's thought to tie in with a physiological phenomena called the ventilatory threshold which kind of demarcates um, what's called heavy and severe 
kind of zones of exercise. Um, that once you cross that, your affective response, which is kind of your, your you know, your, your emotional response to it, starts to take a negative dive and you start to have more of a negative affect from it. Um, and then it's argued that if you have a negative affective response, that's likely to influence your behavior and whether you'll go back and do that task again or, you know, that sort of thing. And um, and so so for me, it was interesting because if all of this these studies are based upon using things like the Borg scale, and so if the Borg scale is not purely capturing information about someone's perception of effort, but it's also capturing other things like their perception of discomfort, then we don't really know whether or not uh, people's kind of effective responses to exercise and, you know, the potential impact on their behaviors and whether they're likely to, you know, engage in and adhere to exercise, any kind of exercise, um, is really down to the perception of effort or whether it's just because certain exercise approaches are cause more discomfort than others um so there's kind of a lot of wider implications about understanding all of this stuff um and, and that's why i think i think it's quite important because you're right we, we almost need to kind of have a better understanding better definitions and better tools to look at these things to then kind of go back and interpret the research that we do have uh, correctly but then also reset and almost kind of like start moving the field forward to understand what all these things actually mean um in terms of you know choice to engage in exercise whether people stick to that behavior and then you know what for those who are doing it what, what role does you know the effort they put into it actually have in terms of the outcomes that they produce from exercise this episode is brought to you by our sponsor arx are you looking to create a cutting edge, high intensity training facility? Are you confused on what equipment to use or how to separate yourself from the masses? Well, then ARX Fit might be the answer you're looking for. I asked Mike Palano from ARX a few questions about how ARX machines are challenging the status quo of the exercise industry around the globe. Mike, if you could, give the listeners a quick summary of why ARX is so different from the traditional machines or tools they're used to seeing in most exercise facilities. ARX is totally different than anything you've seen before. This isn't just another weight stack machine. We've looked at the last 40 years of exercise technology and used that knowledge to create something entirely new. ARX uses a new form of resistance, a motor, and we pair that motor with computer software so that we can maximize the safety, effectiveness, and efficiency of your workouts. So you may be asking, okay, but how does ARX compare to weights? Traditional machines you see in gyms today are based on lifting metal weights and battling gravity. What people don't realize is that when you're forced to lift a static weight like this, one that doesn't adapt or change while you use it, you're underloading yourself rep after rep. And this unnecessarily limits your ability to make improvements. With ARX, we've taken a totally different approach. We removed weights and gravity from the equation altogether. Instead, ARX combines our patented motorized resistance with our custom computer software to provide you with the world's safest, most effective, and most quantified form of resistance training ever. When you train with ARX, you are training to your perfect level of resistance, both positively and negatively 100% of the time. No more guessing what weight to use, ARX does all of that for you, instantly and automatically. We'll also track and measure every second of every rep, so you can quantify all of your workouts to find out if you're improving and by exactly how much. Whether your goals are bigger muscles, increased strength, stronger bones, or just to look good in a bathing suit, ARX can help you achieve all of these and more, but do so in a fraction of the time it would take compared to traditional equipment. If you're looking for the most efficient, most effective, and most quantified piece of exercise equipment on the market today, then look no further than ARX. Thanks, Mike. That all sounds really impressive. If you'd like to learn more about ARX, visit arxfit.com and mention that you heard about ARX on the Corporate Warrior podcast to receive an exclusive deal of $500 off shipping and installation off your ARX machines. Um, and how does this, how does, um, in terms of, in the context of, I guess, the, the those listening who run uh, personal training businesses, you know, one of the things um, you kind of mentioned there and we spoke about offline was, you know, it's hard to know if clients are actually training to failure and actually using maximum effort. Um, 
you know, they might put on a show to express that they are trying as hard as they can and they've emptied the tank. But how do we know that? And what do you have any suggestions for, I guess, personal trainers out there to get the most out of their clients in that regard? Yeah, okay. So uh, that's an interesting question because this all comes back down to like, so if we assume that, you know, effort is, we can assume if you're doing nothing, that's zero. And if you get to failure, like true failure, um, not kind of sandbagging, then like that, that's still failure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, that, that's maximum effort. Um, now, of course, you have to make a certain degree of assumption, but there are certain things that we're starting to figure out, um, at least based on some of our research, that we think might uh, be preventing people from being able to push themselves to failure. And part of that is because without... Let's flash that. Sorry. Uh, the cat's playing up. Um, Bigsy. Come on, Bigsy. Um, it's a very important interview. <laughs> Oh, well, this makes it real. Um, so, you know, it, without appropriate instruction, uh, some people will um, anchor their perceptions of effort on their perceptions of discomfort. So if you ask people to train to failure and or you ask them to do as many repetitions as they can, for example, and you say you want them to keep going until they can't go anymore, that they, they you want them to go to failure, um, the uninitiated, the vast majority, will essentially stop when it feels feels uncomfortable when it feels you know quote unquote hard and because people um don't readily differentiate the perception of how hard they're trying to actually uh meet the demands of the task that is move the weight hold the isometric position whatever um and the perception of how uncomfortable the demand you know trying to meet those demands of the task actually are um also for example you know how how heavy the load is, because that, there's some really interesting research that shows that the perception of load is independent of the perception of effort as well, and also the perception of fatigue, although load and fatigue will kind of interact to, to produce effort. Um, you know, you, you almost need to, as a, as a trainer, get the participant ahead of time to understand the difference between how much effort they're putting into the exercise and how uncomfortable the exercise actually is, and for them to realise that, um, yeah, the discomfort, as much as it's not pleasant, it's transient. Uh, there's no danger involved, involved in it. Um, and to essentially, you know, push through it. Now, yeah, that, that's the kind of first thing that I would say trainers need to focus on is getting people to differentiate the effort for, or the perception of effort from the perception of discomfort and, and making people aware that, um, you, you, you know, you normally try and anchor the two together. Now, the next step is obviously that you should, you know, if you want people to train to a sufficiently high degree of effort, and it's worth saying, you know, as much as I'm a big proponent of training to failure, um, that's not to say that I think that training to, to failure is necessary for, for adaptation as much as, you know, that's been the kind of one of the memes in the hit community for a long time. Um, we don't, the simple answer is we don't actually know. We don't have the, the right evidence to tell us whether or not there is a dose response relationship between effort and adaptation. Um, and, and if there is, whether or not there's a threshold or anything like that, but independent of all that, um, we know that training to failure consistency, you know, there's not really any downsides to it unless you're potentially a professional athlete and it might cut into your, you know, the fatigue might mean that you can't train other factors. But for the everyday person, it doesn't really make a difference. Um, and so training to failure at least means that you have passed that that threshold. And the reason I say that is because people are very poor at predicting how close to failure they are. And we've got data to suggest that. Uh, we did a big study uh, which was published last year with uh, a colleague, Jürgen Giesing, out in Germany. And we had uh, just over 140 participants who predicted, uh, who were asked to give a prediction of how many repetitions they thought they could do to failure and then to actually do reps to failure. And we tended to find that on average, people would under predict by about one and a half reps on average. Uh, now, people got better with more experience, but even the most experienced were still under predicting by one. And these are people with two and a half years of uh, training experience, uh, whereas the least experienced were under predicting by about two reps on average. 
Um, and that varied across exercises as well. So as you'd expect, things like leg press and you know, uh, exercises which we know produce more discomfort seem to affect that. And so it seems as though people are poor at predicting because they're used to thinking about how uncomfortable the exercise is and not differentiating it from the actual effort that they're putting in. Um, we're actually in the middle of doing another study, which I think is really, really cool. Um, and I'll tell you about it off air because it's uh, it's what's called a deception study. So just in case there's any uh, potential participants listening to this, I don't want them to know what's actually going on in the study. Um, but we're essentially looking again to see, you know, uh, one of the problems with that study was we asked people to predict before they start the exercise. And of course, during the exercise, you've got lots of feedback going on of, of how you feel uh, and all of that kind of stuff, which might make your predictions better. So, for example, if we told you to make a prediction before you started doing repetitions um, and then got you to do them, that might be less accurate. And if we said, right, I want you to uh, predict when you're one rep away from failure and stop at that point. Um, where the prediction might be a bit more accurate. Uh, and based on the way we, the data we've got so far, actually, it seems as though, though people are still pretty poor at predicting how close to failure they are. And they tend to underpredict by, again, about, you know, one and a half reps on average, which seems oddly consistent. Um, so, you know, training to failure or making sure that you get clients to differentiate the two, effort and discomfort and training to failure is a good practical step. Now, the, the last thing I would say, say is uh, or last two put points from a practical set sense is you'll always get some clients who just can't tolerate discomfort and um, for those clients the best way to uh, or at least based on the evidence that we, we've got so far to try and reduce the discomfort that they experience during exercise so that they can actually push themselves to that point of failure is to potentially utilize heavier loads um, so we've shown pretty consistently now across a number of studies that lower loads to failure produce more discomfort than higher loads to failure. And so if someone's potentially stopping exercise because they're unable to tolerate the discomfort, then use a condition that reduces the discomfort. We know that load doesn't make a difference for adaptation, so it doesn't matter if you use heavy or light, or light loads. Um, and actually, this is an argument for potentially using heavier loads, particularly for people who can't tolerate it. Now, there is some evidence that the more you expose yourself to uh, phys physiologically, uh, oh, sorry, uh, exercise conditions that produce high feelings of discomfort, uh, that your tolerance of those conditions improves and that seems to be directly related to performance improvement. Um, so there's something to be said of, of at least if you're someone who's not very good at tolerating discomfort, periodically exposing yourself to it to kind of improve your tolerance of it. Um, so, yeah, so I say that those are the kind of practical ways of looking at this and the ways of trying to sort of take some of the information we have already and, and uh, essentially getting your clients to train hard enough. So there is benefit in exposing yourself to a five-minute wall set every now and again. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm just trying to get more people Hello, to do James wall Still. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, that was really interesting and, and I'm sure very useful, uh, certainly useful to me. As, um, as you may know, um, but uh, at some point this year, I'll probably be starting a gym business out in Galway. I don't know if you knew that or if you heard that. Um, I think I heard you uh, talking with... Was it Jim Flanagan, maybe, about it? Possibly. Uh, yeah. Oh, no, it might have been uh, with Doug Holland, actually. Yeah. I should really stop talking about it because it's still very, very early stages. And, uh, <laughs> that's quite dangerous. But, hey, I'm, I'm feeling optimistic. Um, but, no, uh, yeah, so, no, I, I think you make a really good point. I think, uh, to, to be honest, a lot of the trainers uh, and, and serious or strength training entrepreneurs listening to this will definitely have that conversation at the beginning. They will brief them. Obviously, they'll, they'll say, look, you're going to get to a point during this where you really want to stop, but you mustn't stop. <laughs> I, I'm sure a lot of them have that. And I've, I, I know they do because I've spoken to a lot of them about it. Um, and I've done that myself when I've worked with someone. I've, I, you know, I've really hammered that home beforehand. And then, you know, when they went for the work, out, they worked a lot harder um, and they got they pushed through that and you could tell they didn't like doing that but they did it you know um, so no that's a really good point um, is there anything else you want to add in terms of um, I guess what you've learned around the stuff around effort that might be useful to the entrepreneurs out there and the trainers or do you want to move on um I'm not really sure there's much to add at the moment. I think, like I say, you know, it's going to be an area that we learn more about the practical implications of it um, once we start doing more research where we actually take into account 
and you know appropriate definition and differentiation of it from other kind of perceptions and, and things like that so um maybe next time we talk i might have some more to be able to uh to potentially uh add to that so um so we'll, we'll uh we'll we'll think about that for next we'll time it. yeah i want to yeah. i want to nerd out on uh on your latest workouts anyway so that that's cool um so it talked to me you said you said at the beginning uh when we were offline that uh you, you're doing something quite different at the moment in terms of your training so what's the latest well the latest is that i essentially have no training program whatsoever um and that's not to say i'm not training it's just that you know as we said at the start life has changed drastically for me over the last um you know six months essentially um we of course uh you know previously i was predominantly doing body weight workouts in fact you know i'd probably say 95 percent at least of my training was body weight workouts performed at home um we we moved house over christmas and um and we moved into a lovely cute little uh kind of end of terrace victorian cottage and the problem we have is that all of the doors are far too close to the adjacent walls for me to put the uh, door gym up in. No, that's surely so, that's, a, that's a primary um, consideration when buying a property. Do you know what? I can't believe I didn't even think about it. I just I just assumed that there would be at least one door in this house that would uh, that would do it. Um, so yeah, so no, I um, I had uh, had that that issue so so for for the, the beginning of the year i was able to get into the uh, the gym at the university um at, at least once or twice a week and was training you know sporadically with that um we've also got a new places leisure uh, facility just down the road from us and interestingly actually the um St- dr stephen mann who was previously at the uk active research institute uh, went to work for uh, places leisure and uh, and so um, he was very uh, kindly able to kind of hook me up. And so um, I've got a membership there. And also, um, you know, I'm luck- fortunate enough to get a free membership at Fitness First um, with my role at UK Active as well, being that Fitness First is one of UK Active's kind of members. Um, so at the moment, I'm basically just rotating around the free locations when I have time to get in the gym. And it's how much time do I have? What do I fancy doing? And in some senses, it's it's quite nice at the moment that you know I'm so, I'm I'm so busy with everything at the moment. I, I I've I've got you know a million and one projects on the go, and you know I'm responsible for for uh, you know my own projects, uh, for overseeing you know a number of other projects, and and you know I, I I've I've got very little time to kind of think about what what's going on at the moment so in a sense it it almost comes back to i know what you've talked about before is this kind of idea of reducing decision fatigue and just having that very ad hoc process has been quite nice it's a case of like i've still been able to get into the gym you know normally at least once or twice a week um uh, which is you you, what i was doing previously anyway sort of somewhere between one and three times a week um and i'll I'll just jump in and uh, depending upon how busy it is I'll make a snap decision of go right. I'm going to do this, 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 and this, and uh, normally just get a full body workout out in. And if I've got a bit more time, then I'll do, uh, you know, things that I wouldn't have normally done in the past, past um, you know, a bit more frequently. So I've been chucking a lot more kind of, um, uh, you know, advanced techniques and stuff in just for the sake of it. <laughs> Again, just for the kind of enjoyment, the variety, and things like like that. And yeah, it's been quite in a way it's been quite liberating i can't see myself doing it for forever but uh i i'm i i'm on the cards at the moment is um is to get a a pull-up mate or something like that for the home so that i can get back to kind of regular body weight training here um and then i'll go back to the normal process of the similar routines i was doing and um and then the odds kind of like you know work out in the gyms here and there machine base free weights etc um, so yeah, so it's really kind of flexible and ad hoc at the moment, which is interesting. It's also been interesting going back to training in public gyms with other people around. What do you? Uh, how are you finding that? <laughs> well, do you know what? the we- the weirdest thing was actually um, when I got the post at UK Active. The uh, health club management is the kind of big um, industry magazine in the UK, and I think across Europe actually. Um, 
and they ran like a, a a piece on me getting the new the post that you get active and for about two or three weeks every time i went down to places leisure um the staff kept on giving me kind of weird looks as though as if to say like that's that weird guy who comes in and trains ridiculously hard he looks kind of familiar <laughs> so, <laughs> i think they might have recognized me from the picture in the magazine <laughs> So I was I was going in and trying to sort of like uh, I would go in occasionally wearing like a baseball cap. <laughs> I was like I don't want to interact with anyone. Yeah. Your your appearances in the media and obviously on Corporate Warrior are going to make you very very famous. Wow, well, exactly, um, exactly. If, if you're not already, uh, no, that's interesting. So so can you elaborate more? I know I appreciate you're kind of going in and just kind of doing whatever freestyling, and that's actually something that I I struggle with because if I do that and there's no clear endpoint. Um, I, I just find personally, I don't always have the motivation to go as hard as if I know exactly what I'm doing and when it's mm. going to end. Uh, and I blogged about that a little bit before because, um, I thought it might be helpful for, for people who also probably have that same issue. Um, so when you're going in and you're freestyling, like what, tell us about some of your go-to exercises that you're going to do. So normally I will, you know, I'll include at least the kind of big three as a base of whatever I'm doing. So whether that is uh, chest press, pull down, leg press, or, um, you know, there'll always be an, an upper body compound push, an upper body compound pull, and a lower body kind of compound exercise. Um, so that will either be a chest press or an overhead press or some dips. Um, I tend to shy away from the overhead press a bit because of the previous shoulder injuries that I've had. Um, so chest press or dips normally, um, a pull down or a seated row, um, leg press or, or stiff leg deadlifts um, and what I tend to do with them now is because I'm lazy and I can't be bothered to uh, particularly when I'm in a public gym like load up a barbell for dead, deadlifts nowadays because you have to then f- chase around for weights and you never know where they're uh, for plates and never know where they are and it's a pain in the ass. I tend to I'll jump on like the, uh, the seated knee flexion like leg curl and uh, so, like superset that with a pair of, with a set of like um uh, dumbbell stiff leg deadlifts just grab the 40 kgs off the uh, off the bar and uh, off the rack and and just do some nice slow controlled reps with that but so that that will always every time i go in that will always form the basis of whatever i'm doing and sometimes i'll go in and i'll just do that and i'll be in and out uh, you know just depending upon how much time i've got so if i've got like 10 15 minutes that will be it um but if i've got a little bit more time then I might chuck it, like I'll either just do that workout, but I'll maybe add, like do some advanced stuff as well. So I might do a drop set on the chest press or um, at places they've got uh, a line of techno gym plate loaded stuff. And I quite like the leg press, but I've always been uh, cautious with training to failure on, uh, on plate loaded 45 degree leg presses because uh, you always find that the catches for the leg press are always um, a little bit too low. And so the worry is that if you hit failure, uh, sorry, a little bit too high. So if you hit failure before the catches and you can't get out of the bottom, then you just yeah. get constantine into the bottom of the seat. Yeah, I've um, had that happen. That's horrible. <laughs> then, so, yeah, sorry, go on. Yeah, yeah no. Um, so sometimes I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll um, you know, just, just for the for the sake of it, I'll maybe do like a five by five or something on there and just rack up a little bit more more volume and a bit more fatigue. So the, the final set is almost to failure um and and then maybe jump on you know uh knee extension or something like like that and, and finish off the you know the quads uh, but yeah it's always that kind of like basis and um, one of the things that i have really enjoyed about being back at a, a public uh leisure center is that if i go in you know say for example so, so sunday morning this week and uh, i know i've got a bit of time in the morning so i shall probably go there have a workout um, I might actually chuck in some sprints on the uh, on the skill mill um, uh, before, like at the start of the workout, and maybe do some, uh, then just do like a big three. Uh, but then I'll head down and I'll jump in the sauna, and uh, so that, that's been one of the things that I have loved because I, I uh, we were emailing earlier. Um, you know, I absolutely love sitting in a sauna and just not not chilling out, but <laughs> you know, <laughs> relaxing in, in, in a sauna. And I do find it's a, it's a something that I really do do enjoy. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, that, that Rhonda Patrick um, video, which uh, actually Scott Maslinski sent me, who you might be familiar with. I think you've been perhaps have corresponded before with him. Uh, he's, yeah. he's a member within the, the Corpora membership and, and a good friend of mine. And uh, he asked me about that. Um, so, you know, you, you, you and Fisher and, and, 
and Skylar are usually the, the first people I go to with, um, <laughs> you know, uh, to get viewpoints. And uh, now it was very interesting what you came back with. And it sounds like, you know, from what Rhonda Patrick was saying in her video, it sounds like there's a lot. I mean, look, I haven't looked into all the science. And to be frank, I really can't be bothered to look into all the science behind her video. Um, but, but maybe that's bad. But like, it looks like there's so many benefits. Uh, I mean, the muscle gain is probably, you know, very much uh, law of diminishing returns and, and not that important, but all the other stuff, the, you know, the cognitive health, um, the, uh, what other stuff was there? Endurance benefits. Like there seems to be a, a whole raft of um, benefits to it. So are you, are you kind of on board of all of that? I mean, I know you said there you enjoy it, but are you also kind of doing it because of these other things? Yeah, I think um, so. Coming, I mean, I think we've spoken in the past as well. You know, I'm a big kind of proponent of, uh, of regular sort of cold exposure as well, and and I think there are benefits to kind of exposing yourself to those extremes in terms of you know that kind of hormetic ability to tolerate them. But you know, the wider health benefits, I think, are again, it's not something I've looked massively into, but I do recall seeing a um, a quite big um, uh, analysis of um sauna use in in finnish uh you know in in finland recently looking at sauna use and stroke risk and that was a a fascinating study because if i remember rightly um i'll have to try and find it for you after after this and see if i can uh send the link over but i think it was the difference between something like you know no they're, they're a population that like everyone has a sauna in their in their house. <laughs> like <laughs> so, um, every, everyone is is using it. But I think they looked at it in terms of sort of like once, three times, and five times a week sauna exposure, and found like a a, a pretty you know strong dose response relationship between um, exposure to you know saunas and uh, stroke risk uh, in terms of like it declined the more people were using the sauna. So that was really interesting as well. So it suggests that there's potentially some, you know, cardiovascular health benefits to be had from that. Um, what the mechanism for that is, I don't know. Um, you know I would, you know, it has a, a very cautious speculation. It's potentially something to do with the kind of vasodilation that occurs, you know, when you're exposed to heat, um, you know, your, your, your peripheral vasculature will vasodilate so that you can get more blood flow to the surface and try and dissipate some of that heat as your body temperature rises. Um, so, you know, there, there might be some mechanism through that whereby maybe blood pressure is, is alleviated. There's, a, you know, changes in kind of arterial stiffness and, and, and that kind of stuff. Like I said, I've not looked into it into much detail, but um, <laughs> it, it, seems, it seems as though, you know, there, there's potentially something to it. That being said, it's a bit like like any uh, you know. Um, I've not also not seen any uh, evidence to suggest that it's uh, it's bad for you. Um, of course, going and sitting in the sauna for several hours is probably not going to be great for you. <laughs> but uh, in terms of make sure you consume fluid, blah blah blah, you know, acute problems. But that's about everything. But you know, frequent uh, you know brief sauna expo- exposure. Um, I've not seen any downsides to it. And hey. It, it, if if there's no downsides, uh, but also no no plus sides other than like it's enjoyable, then that's still a good reason to do it. For sure. And what's the what's the protocol for you at the moment? Uh, so it's interesting. It varies. So sometimes I'll I'll go down and just literally jump in the sauna. Like if I think you know I, I trained and didn't have time to jump in the sauna, but I still want to get one, you know one or two in that week. I'll just go down. And I'll maybe spend like you know uh, twenty minutes in there jump out, cold shower, maybe pop in for another five, 10 minutes or so, and then finish up with that. So normally about half an hour. Um, if I go in post-workout, my body temperature is normally pretty elevated. And I tend to find that after about 10 to 15 minutes, then my tolerance level has kind of hit that point where it's like I could force myself to stay in there. But um, you know, by that time, I'm not particularly enjoying it very much uh, because I think my you know body temperature is right re- already pretty high once I got in there. Um, so you know, I, I, depending upon what I'm doing, it'll be somewhere between like maybe 10, 15 minutes to half an hour. Now, are you one to like? Are you just in there, just being silent, doing nothing, or do you talk to people? <laughs> <laughs> I tend not to talk to people. It depends on who's in there with me. <laughs> people will talk to me. I don't, I don't mind. Like so comment much. on your ripness. Is that is that how that starts? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, Lawrence. It's where I go to pick up all the guys. Um, <laughs> um, 
No, it, it depends. Like, because uh, uh, I suppose you get the usual kind of stereotypical kind of middle-aged uh, man with everything hanging out, uh, sat in the sauna, um, who's Beautiful. normally quite talk- talkative. And uh, do you know, what? I don't mind it so much actually. It's quite interesting. Uh, you know, you sometimes get some strange conversations in there. Um, I, I probably do prefer it if I'm in there on my own because I tend to just you know, close my eyes and just kind of almost be a bit meditative in there. Um, but at the same time, I don't mind if I'm in there chatting to someone. Cool. Uh, I got some real like kind of random questions I wanted to ask you um, during this kind of last uh, last third of the conversation. Um, I remember a while ago you posted uh, numbers around your changes in lean mass and body fat mass over time, and you kind of joked saying, "Oh, look, I'm wasting away um, because there was a very small change, I think, downward in lean mass, and your body fat was going down as well, I think." And you were already like, you know, whatever it was, eight percent body fat. I can't remember. Um, and just curious, have you done, have you tested that since? Have you, how has that changed for you? Are you still kind of weight the same as you were or? Um, I would say probably not right at this moment in time. Um, <laughs> uh, May, May has been a crazy month in terms of travel, um, very little structure to what I've been doing. So it's been kind of one of those uh, fuck it months and just kind of going with the flow. Um, but I can't remember the last time I probably uh, tested myself, but it's the usual kind of thing. Like, like for me at the moment now, it's it's all you know. A, 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 any changes are typically very small and difficult to differentiate from noise in, in the measurement. So I tend not to uh, to measure much in terms of my body composition anymore. Um, at least with the bob pod, pod that we've got. Um, so. You know, I, I haven't been tracking that that myself. More often now, it's it's just uh, I, I just keep an eye on the bathroom scale, scales and keep an eye on the mirror. And um, you know, if if I'm happy with that, you know, I'm pretty weight stable normally around about you know 70 to 71 kilograms. Uh, at the moment, I'm up to about 72. But like I say, same pounds. Um, about 150. Four fifty-five, something like that. Oh wait, but uh, Pratt's exactly the same as you. Yeah, that's yeah. Because we're quite similar, quite I think uh, quite similar height. I don't know if you're like half an inch shorter than me, or maybe not. I don't know. Um, but that's interesting because I, I I think I told you you probably saw my tweets. I was oh, every Friday morning now. I do a three point caliper and just weigh myself. It takes like five minutes, and it's just yeah. interesting me to see the numbers. But like you know, you've taught me that um, these measurement methods are so 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 much room for error um, to not take them at all seriously. And um, to your point, you know the changes are so small that who knows if there's any positive or negative change happening really. You know, um, so I'm kind of it's kind of interesting that I'm still doing it, although I did forget this morning um, and uh, I'm going to just keep doing it for as long as I feel like doing it and just see what happens. Because, um, I mean, I'm like you, I probably hit my you know muscular potential um, and probably at a very good stage in terms of in terms of overall body composition, you know, low body fat and probably I've probably got what I can get, you know, um, but obviously I've uh, been challenged quite a bit on the podcast, so I am testing things out. But yeah, no, no big changes, <laughs> which is no surprise <laughs> to someone like you, <laughs> I'm sure. Do, do you know what? As you said that, it made me think. So uh, I, I, I've been listening to um, a lot of new podcasts recently, actually, and I've become uh, I, I've been listening to a new podcast, which is a kind of stats data science podcast called Not So Standard Deviations. Wow. And I'm the kind of guy who, when I get a new podcast, I will go back and like start at the back catalog and just work my way through it. Um, and particularly with the new role as well, because I'm traveling from Southampton up to London three times a week. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of commuting time. Uh, so it's just, it's good time to sit and listen to podcasts and ebooks and things. But I was listening to one actually as I was driving back uh, to the office to come ha- uh, from the office home to come have this, this call with you, Lawrence. And uh, and it was interesting. They were talking about this kind of exact thing and uh, debating this idea of whether or not um, I think it was it was an issue with a. This is an old podcast from like 2016. There was a company. Uh, I want to say it was Theranos or Theranos that were looking at uh, something around, around you know blood tests and wanting to be able to take the usual kind of uh, uh, you know a range of tests that are normally taken from a kind of venous blood sample. Uh, and try and be able to do those with kind of fingerprint sampling. So, you know, the, the, the problem is always that normally with these kinds of tests, if you've got less blood, 
then there's potentially less of what you're testing for in there and there's potential for greater variance in the measurements that you're taking. And the kind of debate was a little bit around, uh, um, you know, should should uh, should they be allowed to do this kind of testing if it's not particularly great and uh, uh, or is it OK as long as people understand the variance in it? So if they get false positives or whatever, then they don't worry about it. They go, oh, you know, I understand that there's variance in the measure. Um so, so I guess, you know, this, this kind of thing's fine. It's fine if you want to test it because one, one of the, uh, um, uh, one of the, the hosts was say, saying, you know, she, she tracks everything. She loves her Fitbit. She loves all these things. She, you know, she's a, um, um, quantified self kind of person who, who likes to track everything, but she knows there's lots of noise and variance in there. And, and it's almost like, like that's not going to stop her doing it because it's almost like medical entertainment more so than like necessary <laughs> to really understand what's going on. Like you do it because you kind of want to, you kind of enjoy it. You're kind of interested, but you also know the limitations of it, which is fine. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I don't see any problem with it. Like you said, it doesn't take you very long. And as long, I think it's easy to get uh, misled by it if you don't have an understanding of that. So I can see that, you know, the, the, the problems of it. And I think that's always been my worry about it and why I've kind of, sort of either tried to discourage people from doing it or um or at least got people to kind of understand what what they're what it's actually telling telling them what about things like the uh, thing i found quite interesting and i was thinking about getting one was the aura ring you know have you heard about that so there's a ring that it's like a fitbit but it's a ring and it's uh, very very popular and it tracks everything you know um sleep quality um oh i don't know probably a bunch of other bunch of other markers um but but i thought sleep quality was interesting and and you hear people say like oh uh you know that they'll use it that they claim it's very effective for helping them figure out what works for them so if they have a a a late meal then the sleep quality is off like are you saying that potentially a lot of this is noise and it's not actually as useful as we think yeah (laughs) i think it probably is although yeah as you say that because i've got a fitbit on at the moment okay and uh i'll tell you why i've got that on it's because i've got vitality life insurance and my premiums go down if i hit (laughs) hit certain things so i mean it's not like i'm trying to be more active it's basically i'm just having something track what i already was doing anyway just so i can get the the benefits for it Uh, but this this is supposed to like you know i get a a sleep rating uh it tells me like my sleep quality and things like that uh you know i don't know how accurate it is but I can tell you uh, that if it tells me that I had a, be- a good night's sleep, if it tells me I had a good solid eight hours sleep, I, I feel a bit better after I've read, read that. <laughs> and there, there, there's, a, I remember um, there, there's another great podcast. And I might talk to you about this before as well, called uh, You Are Not So Smart. Yeah, I started listening to that a little bit, yeah. Mm. Oh, it's great. There's, there was one, one episode where they were talking about this study where they looked at placebo sleep and they had, uh, they had, they basically built this kind of device and you know, it did nothing. It was just a kind of fancy helmet with made some noises and, and lights went on and this, that and the other. And they brought, uh, you know, people in and basically said, you know, we're going to uh, we want to assess uh, uh, how much sleep you've had before you do these cognitive tasks. And they basically randomized them into some people were told they had, uh, you know, a poor night's sleep. And some people were told they had a good night's sleep. Uh, in actual fact, you know, it wasn't measuring anything. All they were doing was giving them different information. Uh, but the people who thought they had had a worse night's sleep did poorer on all the cognitive tasks. So there, there's maybe something to be said of this kind of placebo sleep. Um, so, I mean, if I wake up and I think to myself, I know I, I feel like I probably have had a bad night's sleep. Like, uh, I just don't, I don't look, I don't want to validate it because <laughs> <laughs> I, I go, nah, nah, maybe it has been good. Anyway, it uh, should be okay. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think there's, um, I think there's potentially interesting behavioral components to uh, measuring things. And uh, it, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not a psychologist, but I'm becoming more and more interested in kind of uh, the behavioral side, side of things because as much as, you know, you take a kind of pure, you know, statistical perspective on things like measurement error and, you know, individual variance, test retest variability, you know, and and all of these sources of kind of noise that can come in to muddy the signal, um, then there's potentially, there's lots of arguments to be made against kind of tracking various things. But there's, what would be interesting to know is, well, what impact is uh, not necessarily uh, you know, or is the process of actually tracking things having on people's behavior? 
and then subsequently on, you know, certain outcomes. Uh, what information, what result is the information that these measurements uh, are providing having on their behavior as well? Because um, there's research that shows that purely just weighing yourself every day is uh, enough to help you lose weight. And that's not because weighing yourself helps you lose weight. It's because it makes you more consciously aware of the choices that you're making more than likely. And so tracking certain things can be, be useful. Oh, yeah. But there's probably an individual component to that. There's probably, you know, I, I, I know, you know, I had conversations with plenty of people who, you know, they start tracking things and things don't move as quickly as they want them to. Um, partly because for them, just the process of tracking is probably not having an influence on their behavior sufficiently that a change is, at, you know, a detectable, meaningful change is actually going to occur, to occur. And then they also don't understand the variance. So they get discouraged when things, you know, shift slightly in the wrong direction. They think that, you know, whatever they're doing doesn't work when actually it's just statistical noise. And, and so, you know, there, there's, I think there's, there's a lot to understand with this. Um, that, and if you're aware of it, it's probably fine, but. Yeah, it makes me, it does make me, the whole quantified self uh, movement makes me nervous for, uh, from that kind of public health perspective of, of things. Um, I wonder how well equipped the general public is to understand these, these, uh, these concepts. Because it's only growing, that movement. You know, there's more and more wearable tech, right, coming out. Um, it's becoming yeah. more and more popular. It's becoming a massive industry. So uh, I wonder whether that will just inflate that issue. So I suppose we'll, we'll find out. Um, Absolutely. Another nitty gritty question about your training. Um, so I was watching some old school James Steele home workouts. Very impressive as always. Um, I'm just, I mean, I think I know the answer to this anyway, but I'm going to ask you with the push ups, right? You do, I know you'll do like a wide, you did like a wide grip push up at the beginning of the workout uh, on the Iron Gym, which I, I, I love the Iron Gym. I've got one myself. Uh, and then you did your, you kind of did your lower body in the middle. So you did a wall sit followed by bodyweight squats. And then you finished up with um, a narrow push up on the Iron Gym again. Now, I know that stimulates the triceps more, whereas the, the wide is more for the chest. Obviously, both do the same. Both do the same kind of muscle groups, but I guess it's just different emphasis. Um, do you feel like, I feel I feel stupid asking you this because we've talked about this so much in the past. But do you feel like um, you know a wide grip push up is going to probably stimulate you know maximal hypertrophy and you know the muscles that are involved, or do you feel like actually no, you know what, um, a, a narrow push up is actually going to probably stimulate them more potentially? Um, I, I think there's very very little difference to be had for, for either really. Um, you know, it's like we've said, said before, for at, at that point, you're getting into, you know, such small differences that it's questionable whether or not they're measurable. And, um, you know, for some populations, they might be deemed meaningful. And, uh, you know, I still remain skeptical as to whether or not you can really detect the differences between those sorts, sorts of things. At least based on the evidence we have, I'm not convinced that uh, there's really, you know, that much of a dif difference for the everyday person. Um so, you know, again, it comes back to, I think we had this conversation before, like, um, you know, I, I'm not a big proponent of variety for variety's sake. I don't necessarily think it's a necessary component for an effective training pro program in terms of uh, the outcomes it produces, uh, but it can have an impact on, you know, the behavior of the person doing that training. You know, if you get bored quickly, then inject some variety. For me, uh, you know, you, you know, I'm, I, I could I could probably go through through the rest of my life just doing a uh, you know like a big three or you know like a, 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 what I call the big four body weight, which was which would be kind of like a push up, a pull up, a wall sit, and a and a, um, and a plank. Probably do that for the rest of my life and probably not get that bored from it. Um, but uh, you know, it was basically at that point in time where I was doing that kind of like A B workout. Uh, also within the workout, I just had that little bit of extra kind of variation just for the sake of the variation, not because I thought it was really adding much benefit. Fair enough, because I know you also started with a wide grip pull up with palms out and then you switched to a close grip, palms supinated, chin up. Yeah, um, yeah. Which is obviously, again, going to put different amounts of uh, emphasis on the lats and the biceps uh, in each of those. But again, probably same outcomes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it, 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 I, I don't I don't think it makes a big enough dif difference, you know. Uh, but uh, that's an interesting point in and of, it, of itself. And I actually had this issue with a, um, 
uh, a paper that we've, uh, you know, a study that we did uh, not too long ago, and it's been through review process. And um, in, in essence, we had measured, we had looked at two different training programs, and we had measured strength changes, but we had also looked at some performance outcomes because it was done in uh, recreational football soccer players. Um, and so we looked at like sprint speed and jump height because they're normally used as kind of, you know, quote unquote performance measures. And, um, you know, everything kind of improved after both the training interventions. Um, but the the changes in like sprint speed and, and jump height were small, really. You know, they weren't very, very big. And we certainly didn't interpret them as being very meaningful. Um, the, the reviewers, you know, demurred with that that interpretation. You know, they wanted us to kind of um, uh, you use statistics called effect sizes, which I won't get into now, but there are some problems with, with how they're calculated and interpretations of things like that. But they're normally kind of used to say whether something is quote, quote unquote marginal or small or moderate or a large effect. Um, but in reality, like, you know, jump height, for example, increased by about a centimeter, uh, which, you know, it was a real change based on the statistics, but it was you know, it's not, that's not a big change. Someone who played basketball, ball, you know, that, that's not going to make a, 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 a big difference to your game. Um, so what, what we ended up doing was, you know, we, we kind of built into the revision, revised version of the paper that, we, you know, we don't deem these changes to be that meaningful, particularly for the population we were looking at, which was like an amateur recreational soccer team. Um, but some coaches or some athletes might deem you know, a centimetre increase in jump height to be a meaningful change for them. And that might be, you know, it might be worth pursuing that change by doing this kind of intervention. Um, you know, we also show that the data actually suggests that jumping improves your jumping more than, more than doing resistance training. Funny that. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but, you know, it's it, it comes back to this idea of... Um, uh, uh, and again, again, it's it's we can get wrapped up in the statistics, but actually, whether or not something is a worthwhile effect is not a statistical question. It's a question of you know is is the um, the investment to try and obtain that effect in terms of what the intervention is asking you to do, and you know things like that. Is it worthwhile? So you know um, you know as much as I have problems, for example, with certain meta analyses and things like that that suggest that you know. Let's say, you know, for example, slightly greater set volumes within a week might induce, you know, marginally greater improvements in in hypertrophy. You know, that may well be the, be the case. You know, let's assume that I don't have any problems with the, uh, you know, the the study designs and, and, and you know the way the meta analysis is conducted and the studies included and so on. Uh, you know, the that's a statistical um, answer, but the actual question of whether or not it's therefore worthwhile you pursuing that is not a statistical, you know, question. It comes down to, you know, individual value choices and th things like that. So it's always the case of, you know, is, for example, doing a wide grip push-up and a narrow grip push-up, um, does it produce enough of a benefit um, compared to just doing one or the other? Um, probably doesn't produce much, but actually it doesn't take that long for me to do it. And I kind of enjoy, enjoy doing both. So I'm going to do both. Yeah, fair, fair point. Um, and uh, I guess one more thing before we wrap up, you know, um, just on the meta-analysis that you were kind of addressing there, um, I guess, um, you know, we're kind of talking about, I think, I think you're probably referring to the one that Brad and his colleagues did, um, the meta-analysis, uh, which I think I remember saying, I don't know if this is right, and I'd need to go back and refer to it, but was it a 3% change? If you did whatever it was, 10 sets a week, there was like a 3% improvement or something like that. I don't know if I got that inaccurate. But, you know, if that is the case, then I guess one does have to look at that and go, well, is the extra effort really worth it? Uh, maybe if you're a pro bodybuilder, but I don't know, maybe I'm misinterpreting that. Yeah, I, I can't remember off the top of my head what it is, but I, I think one thing that's worth um, thinking about as well, well is, um, you know, I said that kind of effect sizes can be can be an issue. So, so an effect size is just a way of trying to standardize a kind of mean difference between two, you know, or more in interventions. And the, you know, there, there are when we look at something like hypertrophy, we're often measuring it in ways that it's not particularly easy to, you know, it, it is a point 
five centimeter increase in muscle thickness as measured by ultrasound actually does that translate into what someone would consider to be a meaningful increase in muscle size you know most people who are interested in changes in muscle size are interested in it from an aesthetic perspective you know I, I, I've, I, I've yet to see a study that looks at aesthetic perceptions of changes in muscle size to see what the actual, you know, uh, uh, you know minimal changes for for what we would consider to be a meaningful difference. This is somewhere where actually, like, it, it interests. In, I find it interesting that, that exercise and sports scientists often get very insular and they don't look outside their field into other fields. So. One of the benefits I had during my PhD of working within essentially a clinical population of chronic low back pain is, you know, we use various outcome measures to determine whether or not pain has improved or disability has improved. And they will have kind of minimum thresholds called uh, like uh, MCICs or minimal clinically important changes, which basically says, you know, if your change in terms of your pain or your disability doesn't meet this threshold, then it's not really a meaningful change because it doesn't match up with uh, uh, you know a perceived improvement in quality of life, and so we almost like like you know it's not a study that's really going to be done because who's going to be interested in that like a tiny population of bodybuilders and fitness athletes, but I, I, it would be really interesting to see whether or not uh, you know what the kind of threshold for changes in different measurement methods for hypertrophy or lean muscle mass actually amount to, uh, you know, someone perceiving that there has been a noticeable and meaningful change in terms of their physique. Uh, that would be a really interesting study, I think, and that would really help with decision-making processes as to whether or not someone should, you know, train in a particular way or not. And, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> it's actually a thought that I've not had before, for, so, and, I, and I'd be interested to know if anyone else has thought about doing a study like that. I have certainly never thought about that either, and that's really fascinating. James, Love this as always. Uh, really enjoy just chatting to you about all this stuff. It's always, always learned so much. Um, what is the, the best way for people to find out more about you and, and get in touch? Um, so I use Twitter quite a lot. Uh, so on Twitter, I'm at James Steele II. That's uh, supposed to be James Steele II. Um, and uh, I, I now have, I actually have two email addresses now, but probably the best one to uh, catch me on is my Solent email address, which is james.steel at solent.ac.uk. Uh, I'm on, <laughs> as I've been encouraged by my wife, I'm now, now on Instagram, but uh, I don't use it as much as uh, as I, I use Twitter. So uh, Twitter is probably the best thing to, if you want to follow some of our stuff. Oh, and, and of course, also uh, ResearchGate as well, um, where I, I keep track of all of our research um, and then, of course, anything that comes out of my work at UK Active, uh, the Research Institute, um, you, know, you can find information about that on UK Active's website, which has recently been kind of revamped and looks all nice and sexy now. That's nice. Sounds good. Cool. And um, for the listeners to find the blog post for this episode, please go to corporatewarrior.co forward slash effort. So that's E-double-F-O-R-T. And for all episodes, please go to corporatewarrior.co forward slash podcast. And until next time, guys, thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that. Before you head off, head on over to corporatewarrior.co forward slash ebook to get a bunch of goodies, including number one, a free ebook of podcast transcripts with some of my top guests like Dr. Doug McGuff, Drew Bay and Bill Day Simone on how to optimize muscle gain, fat loss and overall health in an efficient, effective and sustainable way. Number two, a free high intensity training business checklist to help you get more clients in your business. And number three, a free high intensity training Google sheet to help you track and improve your training progress. Head on over to corporatewarrior.co forward slash ebook now and enter your email address for instant access. This episode is brought to you by ARX, the most innovative, efficient, and effective all-in-one exercise machines I have ever seen. I was really impressed with my ARX workout. The intensity and adaptive resistance was unlike anything I've ever experienced. I love how the machine enables you to increase the negative load to fatigue target muscles more quickly. And I love how the workouts are effortlessly quantified. The software tracks maximum force output, rate of work, total amount of work done and more in front of you on screen, allowing you to compete with your previous performance to give you and your clients real-time motivation. 
The ARX uses a computer-controlled motor to give you the exact amount of resistance your clients need 100% of the time. This means that the resistance can never become dangerous, is intuitive and simple to use, and can provide you with all of the results you and your clients are looking for in a fraction of the time. ARX is highly effective and efficient in delivering all of the benefits of exercise, including increased strength, muscle mass, cardiovascular conditioning, bone mineral density, and injury recovery. As well as being utilized by many high-intensity trainers to deliver highly effective and efficient workouts to their clients, ARX comes highly recommended by world-class trainers and brands, including Bulletproof, Tony Robbins, and Ben Greenfield Fitness. To find out more about ARX and get $500 off install when you place an order, please go to arxfit.com and mention Corporate Warrior and How Did You Hear About Us field. So again, to get $500 off install when you order, head on over to arxfit.com and into Corporate Warrior and How Did You Hear About Us field.